welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event. Today we're discussing uh, a recent evolution or revolution in federal trademark and unfair competition law. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on our call today are those of our experts. A couple of quick notes before some brief introductions and we get to the program. The first note is uh, one of our panelists, Christopher Riley, uh, had to you know, was called into a meeting and had to step out of the program. So we won't be joined by Chris today, uh, but we hope you can join in a future program. Uh, also for our audience, we'll be looking to you for questions uh, towards the end of the program. So please submit those via the chat function or the Q&A chat function. Um, again, that's through the chat function and we'll be looking to those uh, towards the end. And with that, I'm going to introduce our moderator today. And thanks to our moderator for organizing the program. We're joined today by Mr. Andrew Halby. He's a shareholder at Greenberg Traurig, uh, a place he just joined, and congratulations to him. His longer bio can be found on our website. Um, and with that, I'll give the floor to Andy. Thanks very much for being with us. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, again, I'm Andy Halby. I'm at Greenberg Traurig in Phoenix, where my practice is focused primarily on intellectual property litigation. Before I uh, introduce our distinguished panel, let me take just a few minutes to uh, set up our subject matter. The last year has seen a great deal of activity in the trademark arena. Some of this is statutory. I summarized an article earlier this week spearheaded by uh, one of my colleagues, which you can see uh, on our website online. Congress passed and President Trump signed the Trademark Modernization Act of 2020. This had the effect of restoring in trademark infringement matters the presumption of irreparable harm arising from likelihood of confusion that had been eliminated, albeit indirectly, by the U.S. Supreme Court's 2006 decision in the patent case eBay versus Merck Exchange. Another development in just the last year is a case law development. The Supreme Court resolved a circuit split through its decision in Romag Fasteners versus Fossil Group over whether willfulness must be proven to obtain an award of defendant's product. Uh, profits? The answer is no. Now, these developments weren't our meaningful, but they are not our primary focus today. Uh, to, to begin the presentation of what is our primary focus, um, I'm going to begin with just a few points of federal trademark and unfair competition law that just a year ago, one might have thought were well established. First, and I, and I have the expression federal right to copy in air quotes here, because it, it's an expression that isn't particularly comfortable to use. There is technically speaking, at least in my opinion, no federal right to copy. But there were a series of decisions, uh, beginning with the companion cases of Sears and Copco in 1964, through the Justice O'Connor's opinion for the court in Benito Boats in 1989, that said something close to as a general proposition under federal law, one has a right to copy one's competitors, materials, processes, and so on in the absence of a patent, copyright, trade secret, or, or contract constraint on doing so. And the question uh, that this series of cases you see on your screen addressed was in what regards does trademark law constrain that general understanding under American law, federal law, that all other things being equal in the absence of constraint, you have the right to copy. Well, in the two pesos case, the court held that virtually anything can be a trademark, not just symbols, but even trade dress, such as restaurant decor. Now, those of us on the call who, who practice in or, or pay attention to trademark law, law know that any mark has to be distinctive. It has to serve to identify and distinguish the source of goods or services sold under in connection with the mark. We come to the Qualitex case, the third on your screen, which confirmed um, to many observers that even a color could serve as a protectable trademark, but only if it had acquired distinctiveness. Many read Qualitex to hold that color couldn't be inherently distinctive by itself. So if we think, for example, about the Pink Panther and, and insulation, that distinctiveness would have been something that would have been created or acquired through extensive advertising and promotion, not something that was inherently distinctive. Turning from color marks to product configurations or presentation as trademarks, 
uh, many observers thought um, 20 years ago with the decisions in Walmart and traffics that protecting co product configuration through the trademark laws had fallen into some disfavor with the court. Justice Scalia in Walmart had written memorably for the court that product configuration could never be inherently distinctive, that it could only be protectable, if at all, if the product configuration had acquired trademark significance. And while the traffic's decision from the Supreme Court in 2001 was not a model of clarity, it generally suggested that plaintiffs would find it difficult to prove a product configuration non-functional, which is another requirement for trademark protection under federal law. Let me turn quickly to the issue of genericness. Just setting it up for uh, our panel, um, it was generally understood that a word describing a genus of goods or services could not be lifted from ordinary usage and made into a trademark with corresponding or attendant exclusive rights merely through such advertising and promotion. Now, we're here today because court decisions have injected over the last year have injected some or perhaps even substantial uncertainty into these arenas, and our panel is here to talk about them. Um, before I uh, give some more detailed introductions, let me say something about this panel. We're taking a somewhat unique for this setting commercial approach to uh, our presentation. Our panel consists of working lawyers who are in the business of spending their days working for one or more clients on one or more real world trademark problems. And I'm delighted to introduce those panelists to you now. So with that, let me begin by um, introducing you to my friend, uh, Tony Teese, um, the, the founder of Antoinette M. Teese PLLC based in Billings, Montana. Tony is a registered patent attorney who practices in intellectual property and technology law she, uh, I've, I've worked with Tony for years and I, uh, at some risk of embarrassing her, I will say that in my experience in those fields, she's the finest practitioner in those arts in the state of Montana. Um, she attended Harvard University where she got her Bachelor of Arts degree in economics, went on to the Yukon Law School, clerked for Judge Ezra in the District of Hawaii after that. She then practiced in New York, uh, in DC and New York respectively with Wiley Rain and Sherman and Sterling. Then upon moving to Montana in 95, she practiced with a prominent firm there, the Crowley Firm, went on to become the GC for Rocky Mountain Technology Group, and um, since 2003 has run her own law firm uh, practicing in Montana and clients all over the United States and the world. Uh, our second uh, presenter today is, is my friend and partner, Steve Baird, who is a shareholder at Greenberg Charig in its Minneapolis office. Steve graduated with his undergraduate degree, a uh, Bachelor of Science from the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy, went on to graduate with high distinction from the University of Iowa College of Law. Steve's business is providing strategic guidance on trademark usage and clearance, branding strategies, domestic and worldwide portfolio management, litigation and enforcement, and, uh, and other things for a wide variety of clients. And you can see them listed in his bio. I would, I would take all the time we have if I listed all the different clients, clients and services and goods that Tony and Steve have, uh, have helped with and on over the years. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Tony, um, who's going to talk to us um, about that, that, that first line of cases and, uh, and recent development. So Tony, with that, take it away. Andy, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, folks, I'd like to talk to you about three cases this morning having to do with the functionality uh, doctrine as it applies to trade dress protection. And the three cases I'm going to be discussing today are Blumenthal versus Herman Miller, Ezekai Gilko, or sorry, Glico ver versus Latte International, and then a case that I litigated myself, which is uh, McGowan Precision Barrels versus Proof Research. So that's where we will land uh, after the next 10 minutes. Uh, with regard to Blumenthal, Herman Miller had designed a couple of office chairs, and perhaps Andy could bring up those images for us right now. You got it. And while he's doing that, the the issue at stake was the enforceability of both registered and unregistered trade dress to what you're looking at now, which is the Eames 
chair design. And then, and then right here, Andy's just shown us the Aeron chair design. So there were two different chair designs at issue. With respect to the details of the claim trade dress, I want to tell you that in this opinion, and I'm referring here to 963 Fed 3859, the Ninth Circuit did not get into the details of the trade dress. In fact, what they said is, uh, we're, we're considering the overall appearance, and they use that phrase overall appearance uh, a number of times, and they said, the difference, uh, the differences between the registered and unregistered trade dresses are not material. And frankly, their focus was going to be on the overall appearance. So uh, just with that in mind, the disposition of the trade dress claim with respect to both of these chairs was that the Ninth Circuit upheld the jury trial verdict in favor of the trade dress registration for the Eames chair, the one we're looking at now. And then with respect to the Aeron chair that Andy's just shown you, the case was remanded for further consideration based on an erroneous jury instruction. So let's unpack both of those uh, rulings. With regard to the Eames chair, the court relied on traffics, which is one of the cases that Andy just discussed uh, in connection with his previous slide. And quoting uh, traffics, the court said, uh, there are two types of utilitarian functionality. So there is, well, there are two types of functionality, I should say, utilitarian functionality, which is based on how well the product works. And I know that's about as clear as mud right now. And aesthetic functionality, which is based on how good, that's not proper grammar, but how good the product looks. Um, so you've got utilitarian functionality and aesthetic functionality. I will tell you from having just gone to trial in the proof research case, uh, I was defending there. We'll come back to proof research uh, at the end of my segment here, but I was defending a challenge against registered trade dress. And the plaintiff in that case asserted both the utilitarian functionality and aesthetic functionality and ended up just completely dropping even from, from their trial brief, the aesthetic functionality argument. And having reviewed all of that case law, although traffic sort of treats them as two different things, and having reviewed all of the case law that I think exists on aesthetic functionality and how it differs from utilitarian functionality, you're not gonna find a good explanation of that. Courts really struggle with that. So I, I would have to say up front here that as a practical matter in terms of in the trench litigation, utilitarian functionality and aesthetic functionality are going to be treated more or less as the same thing, even if pled separately. And even if there are maybe nuances in the traffic's decision. So with regard to traffics, uh, the court, this is again with respect to the Eames chair that we're looking at here. And in considering the overall appearance, uh, the court stated that protecting trade dress threatens, well, the determination as to whether the overall appearance is functional hinges on whether protecting the trade dress would threaten to eliminate a substantial swath of competitive alternatives in the relative market. And in that regard, the court cited the four disc golf factors, which are number one, whether the design yields a utilitarian advantage Number two, whether alternative designs are available. Number three, whether advertising touts the utilitarian advantages, not just of the product, but of the design specifically. And four, whether the particular design results from a relatively simple or inexpensive method of manufacture. And again, we briefed all four of those issues in the proof research case, so I'll come back to that. With regard to the Eames chair that's on your screen right now, the court based its decision upholding the trade dress registration on the fact that Herman Miller had provided testimony from its designers that they were, quote, always working to find the exact right look of something and, quote, were as much sculptors as they were designers. Uh, these same witnesses testified that aesthetics were one of the most important considerations in designing these chairs. 
Um, if I sound a little skeptical, it's because we made all these arguments in the proof research case and, and, and lost. Um, <clears throat> and that the visual or aesthetic impact was significant. Uh, a, a program manager for Herman Miller testified that he was not aware of any utilitarian purpose for several of the specific features of these chairs, including the specific trapezoidal shape, which you can see here of the armrests. So there was testimony that they were not functional, um, as well as the one piece construction of the seat and back. Now that's interesting. Um, so they had testimony that that was not functional. I could go on and on specific horizontal stitching of the upholstery, um, not ornamental. Again, there was much testimony along these lines. Now, Herman Miller also introduced testimony that there were a variety of alternative designs on the market and that their advertising materials emphasized the Eames chair's distinctive appearances. Um, specifically through large artistic photographs and statements touting their appearance as, you know, iconic, unmistakable, those kinds of things. Now, in terms of any rebuttal, uh, according to the Ninth Circuit, the rebuttal to all of this evidence did not compel a different conclusion. So on that basis, the court upheld the trade dress registrations for these two chairs. Now, Scrolling down to the Aaron chair, if we may, the, the yeah. trial court, and this is interesting, this was a Ninth Circuit model civil jury instruction. So for anyone litigating trade dress cases, beware that the Ninth Circuit or has now held that this particular jury instruction is outdated and needs to be rewritten. So the judge follows this jury instruction. It was number 15.12. And the jury instruction stated, and I will quote here, a product feature is non-functional if its shape or form makes no contribution to the product's function or operation. If the feature, and the part I'm about to read was the basis for the remand. If the feature is part of the actual benefit that consumers that consumers wish, wish to purchase when they buy the product, that's kind of a mouthful, the feature is functional. It, it's a mouthful and it also, um, it, it doesn't really make sense to me. And that last sentence is the part that the Ninth Circuit held it does not reflect the law, needs to be rewritten and uh, remanded um, for the reason that the district court was apparently uh, unjustified in reading that, that particular instruction to the jury. So that's where we are on Aaron chair. Let's go to, the, let's turn to the next case, Andy. You know, the, the Blumenthal decision, there was a lot of case law, discussion of the traffics case, discussion of disc golf factors. It read like a typical legal opinion. I have to tell you, by contrast, I really enjoyed reading this uh, Glico Kabushiki Kaisha versus Latte International case. Um, thank you, Andy. Uh, this was a case about long stick-like cookies. And the reason I enjoyed reading this case is because perhaps more than almost any other case I can call to mind in my now 30 year career, this was really written in, in plain language. It's a third circuit decision and the citation is 986 Fed 3rd 250. And I'm gonna read to you some of the findings from this opinion and I want to note initially that in from 1993 to 1995, okay, Glico sent cease and desist letters to Latte based on this trade dress argument. So early 90s, in 2015, they sued. I have to tell you that this is a fact that's recited toward the beginning of the decision. And you have to ask yourself whether the court's ruling is based in part on the fact that there was a 20 year span between the cease and desist letter and the filing of suit. Um, you know, there is an obligation um, to pursue any IP infringement claim with, with, uh, with due diligence. So here's some of the language they used. The functionality doctrine keeps trademarks from usurping the place of patents. I like that. That's a good explanation. That, that's a good, uh, uh, distillation of the traffic's case right there. They said, conversely, a design is not functional if all it does is identify its maker. If 
again, plain language, language that a jury will understand. This is language we should all be using in front of, you know, perhaps judges who don't see a lot of IP cases and certainly in jury, in a jury case, jury trials. Um, the court said that uh, if one way to determine whether a feature is functional is if it's essential to the use or purpose of the article, quoting from Qualitex there, uh, some quotes from Traffics. I will note that there was no citation nor reference to the disc golf factors at all in this case. And then uh, quoting McCarthy, and they quote McCarthy quite a bit, uh, the court concluded here, as the leading trademark treatise concurs, functional means useful. So if you have evidence that a feature or design makes a product work better, then you're gonna be able to prove functionality. So in this case, the court held that every feature of the registration uh, relates to the practical functions of holding, eating, sharing, or packing the snack. The same is true of the stick shape. Uh, the court acknowledged there was plenty of evidence that Glico promotes uh, its convenient design. And then Glico also defended its stick-shaped snack on the grounds that its utility patent was not specific to the features that constituted the trade dress. And the Third Circuit concluded that the district court erroneously considered the utility patent for that reason, but that that error was immaterial. Um, and then concluded, uh, even setting that aside, many other factors show that Pocky's trade dress is functional and so not protectable. And the district court properly granted summary judgment. So I go back to that 20 year time span. And I just think if you try to enforce uh, any kind of IP, whether it's patent, trade dress, or copyright, 20 years after you sent the cease and desist letter, the court's most likely going to find some way to rule against you. So I know I'm uh, limited to about 10 minutes or so here, so I'll just spend a few minutes talking about the proof research case. Now, I represented uh, proof research. We filed a trade dress infringement case in the U.S. District Court in Montana, and then our um, this was anticipated, but our when the process server served the complaint on the defendant, McGowan Precision Barrels, McGowan was ready and handed that same process server, kid you not, uh, their petition to cancel our trade dress registration. So the process server turned around in his car, drove back to Proof Research and served us um, with that petition to cancel. Um, we were anticipating this. We wanted to be before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board on the issue of validity. We had an issued registration and we figured we would be in front of you know, judges who are steeped in the case law and would understand the nuances of a functionality argument in particular. So the plaintiff in this case asserted, so we were now the defendant before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, the plaintiff asserted five causes of action in an attempt to invalidate our trade dress functionality, which traffics would refer to as utilitarian functionality, multiple marks, which I won't discuss today, genericness, I won't discuss today, um, fraud, which won't is not on our agenda for today. I did not prosecute this application, by the way, nor did I file it. Um, and then aesthetic functionality, which I mentioned earlier, was essentially wrapped up with the first cause of action. In terms of functionality, uh, proof research did have, when, when the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board proceeding was initiated, a utility patent application that was pending for its seven layer carbon fiber laminate design. You are looking at here in this image, the outer layer, the seventh layer, after the carbon fiber is wound at a specific angle. And I, there's not enough time in just a few minutes to get into the manufacturing process, but manufacturing process is something that courts absolutely, and the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board will want to hear about uh, when assessing functionality. That is absolutely something you will get into. But you we're looking at here that seventh layer wound at a specific angle and then ground in a specific proprietary manner. It's not coated, it's not concealed, this isn't a paint or a sticker. And I, and I will tell you that the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board um, invalidated our trade dress registration. And one of the things they said is that the trade dress did not constitute a concealment of that outer layer 
Um, I don't think that sh is or should be a requirement of a registered trade dress, but that was one of the things they pointed out. Um, I'm a bit frustrated, frankly, Andy, I promise you won't go on and on, but reading the Latte International case and their, their, their comment that the utilitarian patent, the, the utility patent, did not go to the trade dress because we made the same argument here. So our utility patent was based on that specific, um, not the thickness, the carbon fiber wind angles, which differed among those seven separate layers, you know, the relationship between the differences in angles among those seven layers. So our utilitarian patent didn't go to what you're looking at here. This is just what it looks like when you're done finishing it. And, and right. the, the utility patent in and of itself uh, left open the possibility of finishing it in a number of ways. So in short, you know, unless there are questions, um, that's the proof well, case. Of, yeah. yeah. That was well, Tony, actually, it's funny you mentioned that we are, we are, we are starting to get some questions in, but I think I'm going to hold them uh, for the time being until, until uh, we hear from Steve and then we'll, we'll take on the questions. I'll read them and then we'll, we'll team up for answers at the end, if that's all right. You bet. Um, <laughs> Okay, so 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 with that, let me let me let me uh, turn this over to Steve. And Steve, I'll let you begin your presentation while I'm calling it a slideshow here. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Andy and and Tony. That was a that was an excellent presentation. Uh, wonderful to hear those updates. Maybe before I jump into what I was going to talk about, um, I, I thought. When I, when I heard you, Tony, describing the jury instruction um, in the Ninth Circuit that um, is being questioned, um, it struck me that it is very much like the purchaser motivation test that um, was rejected. I think that was a Ninth Circuit case way back in the anti-monopoly decision that triggered a Lanham Act change that said, Purchaser motivation cannot be a basis for determining genericness. And so when you're, when you're, you know, I, I like to think of functionality as being the, the you know, the, the twin of genericness when you're in the world of non-traditional trademarks. So it's kind of fascinating to hear purchaser motivation type language seeping into um, that jury instruction. Does that make, am I reading that right? <laughs> Yes, I, I, Tony, Tony's nodding, and I and, and I'm yes. agreeing. I think I think you're right. Well, thank you all, and I think um, this is my first um, foray um, in this forum. But I'm happy to be with you all today. Um, I thought I would provide maybe three updates in the trademark and brand protection field. I've been doing nothing but trademark and brand protection for about 30 years now. I was a registered pharmacist before law school, so I thought I was going to um, be a patent attorney and kind of fell in love with the trademark era. So that's really been my focus um, for the last three decades, I'm um, shocked to say. Um, you know, after graduating from Iowa Law School in 1990, I, I spent a year clerking for Wilson Powell in, in D.C. He was a senior judge on the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And that's relevant because he was he was the the he was the judge who joined Pauline Newman in in Ray Owens Corning back in 1985, so five years before I showed up to work for him. He sided with Pauline Newman in a two one decision to basically reverse decades of a per se rule against ownership of single single color trademarks, and the trademark office had been dead set on um, not permitting registration. And it was really, it took, as as uh, Andy highlighted, um, the Pink Panther um, case and that licensing arrangement to really um, raise the possibility of a trademark being able to be wrapped up into a single color if done properly. Um, so then a decade later, um, in 1995, as Andy identified in, um, in the Qualitex case, basically the Supreme Court kind of um, took all of the arguments that, that my judge and Judge Newman thought were persuasive in Enrique uh, Owens Corning and said, um, no, color can function as a trademark. It can serve the purpose of the trademark as long as it identifies, distinguishes, and indicates source. And so 
Um, we've now been living with with that decision for what almost um, a quarter of a century. And just last year, the Federal Circuit um, revisited the color trademark issue in a case, a presidential decision in called In Re Forney. Um, I don't have a site for you, but it's um, easily um, obtained um, online. I don't know that it's that it has a, a Fed um, uh, second site yet. Um, but it was importantly not a single color trademark case. Qualitex was a single color trademark case. In, in Ray Owens Corning was a single color trademark case. Um, in Ray Corning involved really three colors that kind of bled into each other. And, um, and it also related to a color scheme that appeared on packaging. So to kind of tie into some of the things that um, Andy and Tony have already said, kind of packaging or trade dress, the Supreme Court said, has can be inherently distinctive. And so um, the Federal Circuit really, by extension in N. Ray Forney, has said, you know, we don't read Qualitex to forbid a multicolor trademark from being inherently distinctive. And so um, that's really the, the development for the day. Now, I, I guess we'll have to wait and see whether the Supreme Court weighs in on that particular question in the future. But for now, um, applicants are free to argue that, you know, we're not talking about a single color trademark. We're talking about a multicolor pattern that appears on packaging or perhaps appears on the goods themselves. And in that context, applicants are free to argue that, um, that, that it would be fair to presume consumer um, perception of that as a trademark and have it be considered inherently distinctive as opposed to what was said in Qualitex where you have to prove acquired distinctiveness. It reminds me of a case I worked on probably 15 or more years ago for a company called Datacard um, where we helped them register the color blue as applied to these um, printer cores that would be part of printers that would create credit cards and, and other sorts of um, ID cards. And so um, the, the, the printer cores were the replenishable products to make these things. And as you can imagine, um, they faced all sorts of um, price competition from um, Asian uh, knockoffs. And, and so they were frustrated every time they changed the color um, that color would get mimicked. And so um, they ended up developing a, um, a translucent blue with, with suspended platinum flex. And I made the very same arguments that prevailed in Forney, you know, years earlier, but it was unsuccessful at the PTO to the examining attorneys, maybe we were before our time. But it allowed us to keep that application pending long enough and to influence marketing materials in a way that they would look for advertising such that we could keep that intent to use application pending for a period of time. We made a number of arguments to say, this isn't a single color. Um, this is, we're not, we're not within Qualitex. This is, this is an inherently distinctive um, mark. And um, while we ultimately amended to um, 2F to show acquired distinctiveness, we were able to shrink that gap of, of usage. We would normally think you need five years or more of use to an 18 month period of time. So all of those rights could relate back to that original filing date of the uh, intent to use application. Um, the slide before you illustrates the most recent example of a single color mark that I've been involved in. And Chris Riley, it was so disappointing. Chris has a fantastic new position and he's he's moved from Yuma, Arizona to Boca Raton. So I think he's um, he's thrilled about this new opportunity and he was unable to, to join us today, but he was the general counsel of Dow and Company and I worked with him on obtaining, first of all, this single color registration for the color purple as applied to bottles that, that hold um, herbicides. And the significance of, of obtaining that registration was because 
um, the permit brand was starting to receive generic competition. And as is frequently the case, and as, as I described in the data card example, um, most folks appreciate that they can't use a brand name when they're going to compete, right? They will be talking about counterfeiting, perhaps. Um, but in, in the permit case, they were using a different brand name, but they, they copied the purple bottle. And so that, that resolved favorably with just um, a letter writing campaign that didn't involve litigation. Um, but it, it really illustrates the point that just from a commercial perspective, um, it, it's important to think really broadly about trademarks and not um, be focused only on word marks when you can capture the non-traditional trademark elements. And, and satisfy the trademark office that you you built a brand around those non-traditional elements that provides so much more um, power to be able to keep um, competitors at a fair distance. Um, we can move to the next slide, Andy. And and that really kind of then um, provides um, you know getting back to the kinds of products that you know the second amendment was was um, designed for uh, and and um, one of the experiences I had a few years back was helping Walter who was facing a similar problem to that those that I just identified they were um, there's there's a lot of replicas that are produced in the airsoft industry and so um, what they were seeing is cheap knockoffs coming in that you know, they were smart enough not to put the Walter brand name or the P99 brand name or the PPK brand name on the replicas, but the shapes were the same. And so getting a non-traditional trademark registration for the, the contours and, and shape of those handguns that um, uh, were, were very important to the, to the business. And um, it's not an easy task to show acquired distinctiveness. There were maybe three um, firearm trademark configuration registrations when we started that process and we added another three. There may be very well more now. Um, but one of the things that we had working for us was all the movie references to the PPK and the P99, and it was well known to be James Bond's uh, guns of choice. So that's that's always helpful when you have James uh, Bond on the side. Um, the image below the, the handguns is um, a depiction of from a federally registered trademark uh, for uh, another outdoor industry client that I work for, Paradigm. And we were able to obtain using Section 2F and acquire distinctiveness um, a, a registration for a red band that appears in the middle of that. Uh, of that arrow, archery arrow. One of the things that's helpful um, to build those kinds of rights in a non-traditional trademark, in that case, they all also had a word mark called red zone that um, was federally registered and it helps kind of draw attention to that particular feature as something that would be telling you who's behind it as opposed to um, it serving some functional purpose. That then leads to the image below it. And no, it's not a roll of toilet paper. It happens to be um, the drawing associated with a, an application that was filed by the Hodgson Powder Company um, to try to register the color white for uh, preformed gunpowder charges that were in, uh, in the color white. And um, it's, it's a, it, it has, uh, Fascinating parallels to some of what uh, Tony Tony described in terms of functionality. Um, it's one where I represented another ammunition manufacturer that didn't really like the idea of Hodgson owning a white, um, the white, the color white for gunpowder. And so we filed a notice of opposition that was about 50 pages long. We discovered a patent that was in a utility patent. It was in existence that, that spoke about um, um, the ingredients that were added to replace carbon so it would reduce um, the amount of crawling within a barrel. 
And so there were there were um, a series of functionality arguments that we deployed in a, about a 50 some page notice for opposition. And interestingly, this was a case that went to the TTAB before we ever filed our notice of opposition. Hodgson had won and convinced the TTAB to overrule an examining attorney that said that they had not acquired distinctiveness in the color white. They also had a word trademark to kind of draw attention to it. And they had done a very good job of executing um, what we call look for advertising to try to you know, educate consumers that this is really something that's source identifying, not something that's just aesthetic or uh, ornamental. And so after prevailing at the TTAB, the mark was then published for opposition and we opposed, filed a 50 page notice of opposition detailing various grounds for functionality. And, and Hodgson uh, never answered. And so we prevailed by default. So um, functionality can be a, a powerful tool. Um, one of my former partners at the Fish and Richardson firm years ago, Tony Fletcher, has oftentimes written and said that functionality is just a ticking time bomb because there's no there's no statute of limitations on when you can bring a functionality chart. So maybe let's turn now quickly. We've got maybe I've just got a couple more minutes here. Um, and when I speak about um, genericness, I often throw this slide up and, and we don't really have an interactive environment for everybody to raise hands and, and, and say which one of these is not generic. But, um, you know, spoiler alert, it's, it's booking.com and that's because of the Supreme Court decision from last year um, where um, it's interesting if you think back to the, the Owens Corning decision, that's one where the trademark trial appeal board made a ruling and then the applicant went straight up to the federal circuit for the appeals for the federal circuit. And when you appeal that way, there's a frozen record and you can't add to it. Um, in booking.com, um, the, the trademark trial appeal board was asserting a per se rule to say when you have a generic term for the goods or services and you add .com to it, a generic suffix, you, you can't have anything more than something that's generic. And the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board um, said booking.com was in fact generic. So I think very smartly, the applicant didn't go straight up to the federal circuit. They went, uh, they, they uh, sought a de novo trial in the Eastern District of Virginia and got a more favorable form there added to the record. Um, the Fourth Circuit agreed um, that uh, Booking.com could serve as a trademark, and the Supreme Court just last year um, agreed and and rejected the trademark office's attempt to apply this per se rule that, in some sense, would you know afford brand owners predictability, but at the same time deny um, the reality that. Uh, when consumers perceive a certain designation as being as serving the purpose of a trademark and not only identifying goods and services and distinguishing those goods and services from those of others and indicating the source of those goods and services, with those three elements, you have the makings of a trade and the Supreme Court agreed with that. Now, Steve, Steve, if I could jump in, we've, we've gotten a question from the audience that I think is appropriate to um, and it relates to colored trademarks but 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 i think it also resonates thinking about consumer perception and it's a thoughtful question for colored trademarks i'm getting some feedback are you hearing me okay i'm here for you okay what is the standard of specificity computer rgb codes light wavelength spectral range etc what if a particular product color looks different under different lighting sources, e.g. natural sunlight, fluorescent light, and so on. My answer, at least, would be um, the legal test relates to the ordinary consumer's perception. And you see that concept coming through in a variety of ways in the trademark law. For example, um, in the booking.com case, um, on that issue, the in inquiry would be who's the 
average ordinary consumer who's perceiving the mark booking.com. And I think in the color trademark context, the inquiry too would be um, what's, what, what's, what's, what's the perspective of the ordinary consumer of goods or services sold under and connected to the mark? Do you, do you two have any, any other reactions uh, in response to that question? I, I agree with that, Andy. I would also add, you know, under normal purchasing conditions. And so I think one of the, you know, I mentioned about there was decades of case law that said you can't own colored trademarks. One of the concerns was courts' inability to resolve, you know, issues about shade confusion. And um, both the Supreme Court and and, and the Federal Circuit in, in Ray Owens Corning said, you know, it's the test is likelihood of confusion. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that courts deal with. Um, and shade confusion, you know, can be determined. Um, I think that one of the things that I've noticed in the trademark world in terms of registration, more and more parties are maybe limiting the scope of the registration by plugging in a, a Pantone number to associate with it. And I've never gone that direction. The registrations I've obtained are, you know, purple, blue, um, pretty, pretty broad. Um, I wonder whether parties might be able to use Section 18 as a as a tool to narrow the scope of those to the actual um, shade that that, that uh, is in fact being used in commerce. But um, I think that. You know what we're talking about is likelihood of confusion, and um, the court's going to have to consider what are the the purchasing conditions, what are the normal lighting conditions there, and and that'll all be part of the mix that they consider in trying to determine whether there's been infringement. Okay, thank thank you, and and Tony, let me let me flip this one over to you. You know, one of you uh, I think very appropriately commented early in the presentation that in in several ways. When we're talking about genericness, we are talking about functionality. They are large, you know, the, the question is, are you serving trademark purposes? Or are you serving other purposes? And, and the question comes to us from the audience, from someone who self-identifies as being primarily in construction law, where the word function has, a, you know, a solidly blue collar meaning, as, as, the, as the questioner puts it, and asks, can we give a general overview of the concept of aesthetic functionality. To, to my knowledge, yeah. the Supreme Court has never defined what that is. I've always thought of it as if you buy it for how pretty it is or how pleasing it is and how it looks or impacts your senses. But even that definition fails because that has usefulness. So so how would you answer the, the question? Yeah, I'm dying to answer this question. I don't know if the gentleman who posed the question is a hunter, but I'm going to use my hunting example because I think the rifle barrel trade dress, and maybe Andy, I don't know if you want to pull it up, is a, is a great way to address this. And the caveat being, okay, that courts have really struggled. And as Andy just alluded to, you're not going to find a clear delineation between aesthetic functionality and utilitarian functionality in the case law. However, this is how I argued it in our case, and I think it makes sense. So if you look at our barrel, the aesthetic, the utilitarian functionality argument would be, I have to wrap the outer layer of this barrel at a 45 degree angle and then sand it and then, and then hand polish it and leave it just that way in order for that barrel to function, for it to get the projectile or the bullet right out of that barrel. That would be utilitarian functionality. Here's aesthetic functionality, okay? It has to look that way. Oh, well, because that resembles camouflage and camouflage, you know, patterns have a utilitarian function in the hunting context. So I have to have a rifle barrel that looks this way when I'm in the field, because that way the deer or the elk or whatever, you know, the bear won't see me. Now, literally this argument was made in our case when it came to aesthetic functionality with, and they had images of people wearing camo apparel and holding these rifle barrels and tried to make the argument that because we were somehow advertising camo apparel, you know, showing people wearing camo apparel and holding these rifles at the same time, that they made the leap that therefore there was some aesthetic functionality to the way this barrel looked. We refuted that in two ways. You can tell from this image right here. This is still 
car this is carbon this is still reflective you can see that in the image and so the light shines on it it's going to look just you know a lot like a steel barrel to some degree you know it's going to be reflective so we argued no this isn't at all like an opaque surface or or even painting it or putting a seracoded finish on it to resemble camo you could do all of those things and i won't get too far in the weeds here so we were tried to refute that, that argument that way and then here was the best argument we sell these barrels to the military and when the military get them they don't leave them like this unless it's for their personal use like a navy seal and i shoot competitively and we had testimony from a navy seal who shoots competitively who said this finish is not functional but when they are using it for their military operations they're going to seracote it that's like a paint and make it black or olive drab green or something else so anyway that's the best answer i can give to that wonderful question about what is aesthetic functionality? It, it would be have to be the argument. I view it, Andy, not so much as the argument that I purchased it because of the way it looks. To me, that proves it's a trade dress. So that's kind of the opposite of what you're trying to prove when you're arguing aesthetic functionality. I think they have to show it 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 somehow functions in a certain way because of the way it looks. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate that, and thank you to the audience for the questions. In the in the in the few minutes we have left, I'm going to turn it back to Steve real quick to go ahead and address his last slide. Um, and so let me share that so we don't fire away. Yeah, so, so the last update I wanted to bring folks' attention to is something called, you know, the, the trademark office is obsession lately with informational refusals and, and determining that certain matter is informational and, and incapable of serving as a trademark without going through the effort of building a case for genericness. So the outcome is the same um, as genericness, but the record needed to support it is, is very different. And this all started, I would say, in fervor back in 2016, maybe 2017, around the time that the TAM case and the Brunetti case were percolating through um, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board and the courts, and it was starting to look like maybe Section 2A of the Lanham Act for disparaging and scandalous subject matter, you know, might become unconstitutional. And I would say the USPTO issued an exam guide in early um, 2017 detailing um, all the ways in which um, examining attorneys might be able to refuse applications based on informational matter that in their view would be incapable of ever serving as a trademark. And um, this, the exam guide was then made part of uh, the 2018 version of the TMEP. That's the, the Bible that um, examining attorneys um, consult when they are issuing refusals. Um, but this particular um, infographic didn't make it into the TMEP. I'm throwing it up here on the screen to help illustrate the point that basically all roads lead to incapability as far as, as this chart shows and as the, the, the TMEP um, reads now. Um, and what, what I think is important for folks to appreciate is the kinds of refusals that we're seeing now from the PTO on matter that you would normally expect to be maybe issue, have the trademark office issue a descriptiveness refusal under section 2E1, that the matter is merely descriptive. And then that though gives you the chance to either amend to the supplemental register and try to come back later and prove that you've acquired distinctiveness. And then in the meantime, your supplemental registration keeps others on um, from being able to register confusing or similar marks. Um, or um, the other path would be to build a case and show that you've now acquired distinctiveness in this merely descriptive term. Um, the, the trademark office's focus on incapable matter now deprives an applicant of the ability to go attempt to make that showing. And so when that evidence, evidence is picked put forward now, it's typically disregarded as de facto secondary meaning um, because um, the trademark office has jumped to the ultimate conclusion that we don't care how much evidence you show us, you're never going to be able to show that you've acquired distinctiveness. 
And next slide, Andy. And that is because of a federal circuit decision back in 1999, the Boston Beer Company case um, that owns the Sam Adams brand. And um, they were attempting to register the mark, the best beer in America. And in that case, they were unsuccessful in proving acquired distinctiveness. And then the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board went on and, and kind of said, and, and we think it's incapable anyway. Um, the Federal Circuit did just the same thing when it reviewed um, the board's decision. And from my perspective, I call that dicta. And so my hope is that when we take into consideration that the Federal Circuit decision on incapability in in Ray Boston beer would be considered dicta because it wasn't essential to affirming the refusal based on a lack of proving acquired distinctiveness. If we take that and combine it with the federal uh, with the Supreme Court's ruling in Booking.com saying that consumer perception controls what um, whether or not matter serves a trademark purpose. My hope is that combining these two elements will arm applicants to, you know, fend off these these kinds of um, per se attacks on matter that um, gives applicants no hope currently of being able to show that they've acquired the same. So we have just another minute left, and, and I think I'm going to take the opportunity to um, thank both of our panelists. Let me uh, let me turn off the share. Um, thank, thank you both for coming and, and talking about this, this very interesting subject matter. Um, thank you to the audience for uh, for the questions. We, we got one right at the end, and I if we, it, and, and I say this with respect and affection. If we had an hour, we could tackle it. It asked whether these developments are uh, like the evolution of business method, patents, and patent eligible subject matter, and is it a good or bad thing generally? And you know, I, I we don't have another hour that it would take to give that the uh, the attention and respect it deserves, but it's a great question. And generally, I want to thank um, I want to thank Tony and Steve for being here. I want to thank the Federalist Society um, for giving us the opportunity to talk to the audience. I'm sure uh, you know T Tony and Steve and I, for that matter. All are available and, and readily findable on the internet. If you want to engage in any further discussion on any of these issues uh, privately, feel free. Um, but Nick, with that, I think I'm going to turn the microphone back over to you to close us up. Well, thanks very much, Andy. Thanks for organizing. Uh, thanks to our panelists and our moderator uh, for this great discussion today. Uh, thanks to our audience for calling in for your great questions, great engagement. Um, also, uh, just a reminder, we welcome your feedback on this program and others by email at info at fed-soc.org. Also check your email and our website for announcements about upcoming Zoom events like this one, especially with the Supreme Court term winding down, we're covering all those cases this week and next week. So uh, take a look on our website to uh, see our coverage of those cases and register. But until next time, thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. <laughs>